uh, then you've got pancake syrup at the ready because it does taste mighty good. It's not going to be as strong now as uh, the um, Sambucol uh, or some of the other brand names for um, for the Sambucus. Uh, that one is Sambucus nigra. This is Sambucus um, americana. But both of them have those properties of being antiviral. It's not going to be as strong because the one that you purchase uh, for colds and flu that's antiviral is going to be um, concentrated. But nevertheless, this is excellent uh, to have on hand and you can use it the same way, medicinally or culinary. Um, then uh, one of the ways that I had used it previously when I was using it only as an edible, uh, of course, was jelly um, and wine. Uh, when I lived in Florida and Tallahassee and I was in the Lady Plant Society there, um, several of us entered into the state fair in Tallahassee and in the wine division, which is interesting, they had a wine division, the three top winners, first, second, and third, were um, wild things. And there was cactus wine and hibiscus, which is a Jamaican hibiscus that has a, a fruit on it. And the third one was my wine, which was elderberry wine. So uh, that's how good it is. <laughs> and the other good thing that you can do with it, and I'm gonna show you right here, and here you go, if you can see it well, elderberry pie. Um, my husband's favorite is apple elderberry pie, and I have it in the Roadside Rambles cookbook. And it's also the recipe, and we actually make it. This is Mountain Kitchen, which is a video that the uh, Smoky Mountain Association that runs the bookstores in the park and who I work for. And they published that some years ago, and we actually make this pie in the kitchen there at the John C. Campbell Folk School. And it's apples, elderberries, either the fresh elderberries or you can use the syrup if you, it's a different season and you don't have the elderberries. Um, and usually I flavor it with uh, ground uh, dried spice bush berries from the spice bush plant. If you don't have those, then you can use cinnamon, of course. Um, so being that this is his favorite, it's called Jerry's Harvest Pie. Um, and as he says, well, it's a healthy pie because you have the elderberry, which is antiviral, and you have um, the spice bush berries, which are anti-inflammatory, if that's what you have available to use. And then, of course, apples have pectin, and pectin's good for diabetics, so there you go. You know, you have no guilt in eating that particular pie. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, one of the other things that, um, that I have in my garden, which is usually collected on the roadside, and I've brought the seeds to my garden. So I do have some things that, since they're not available readily uh, to forage, then I will bring the seeds and get them in my garden. And one of those is a relative of the uh, quinoa grain. The um, Kinopodium album is this one in my hand here. It's going to seed, so this, the leaves are going to be awfully small. But its close relative is Kinopodium quinoa. And that is a, a South American variety of this plant um, because that one is larger and the grain is much larger, so it's easier to winnow it out. And of course, it's in commercial use now. This one would have been used, of course, by uh, natives here, and it's one that I've always loved. I love the flavor of it, sometimes called wild spinach, because you can substitute this in any spinach recipe, bar none, any of them. The, uh, the other name for it is goose foot, because you can see it kind of looks like a goose's foot. That's one of the names for it, it's goose foot. Um, lambs quarters, because lambs were quartered in an area where this grew because it helped to fatten them up faster. So it goes by a number of names. And as I said, it's usually the, the um, leaves are much larger than this, but as it begins to uh, bolt up and go to seed, the, the leaves get smaller. Here's one that's a little bit larger there that you can see. So before it goes to seed is when I'd be collecting the leaves and I freeze them ahead of time, uh, blanch them and freeze them, and then use them later in things like quiche or lamy lasagna, uh, any number of things, but uh, very tasty. And I serve it to company, and they don't know it's not, you know, spinach, mushroom, quiche. Uh, they think it's, you know, that's what they think it is. And then I'll tell them that they just ate a wild thing, and but they love it. So that's something to look forward to. The um, 
and I'm letting it go to seed so that I'll have more. Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll ca catch this a lot earlier when the leaves are bigger and uh, just leave a few to go to seed. But this is something that you can watch for. One of the places that you'll find it is in a cornfield. It seems to really love being next to corn. And even if you didn't plant it there, it didn't realize the birds had brought it in, but it's gonna be there. It's in almost every cornfield that I've seen, unless the farmers have put a pre-emergent out. Um, and this actually helps the corn grow. It has really deep tap roots, so it brings up trace minerals to the surface. And the corn being a grass has very shallow roots, so it can pick up those trace minerals. And I tried that in my own cornfield. It kept blowing down um, so frequently that I got some of this and planted it in several, among several rows. And the corn near it was healthier, stronger, and the ears were bigger, all of those that grew near the lamb's quarters. And that section of the corn didn't blow down when the windstorms came through. So it really, you know, was able to try it and find that it really did, uh, was a good companion plant to corn. Now, of course, the farmer is going to call it a noxious weed because he wants to be harvesting with a harvester, nothing but corn. He doesn't want any other, you know, weed material um, in his harvesting uh, machine. So it's going to be um, on a list of 10 plants. I was telling Ann the other day that I remember in the uh, feed store over in Gatlinburg, I saw a, a poster and it had pictures of the 10 noxious weeds for the farmers to look for and make sure that they had something to eradicate them. <laughs> I looked it over and I said, you know, eight of those 10 are my vegetables. <laughs> I tried to buy the poster, but they wouldn't let it go. So <laughs> it goes to show you a lot of good things out there to eat that, uh, uh, you know, it's good for some folks and other folks. It's, it's not what they want to have around. Uh, another one that um, that I, I purchased seeds for this because I particularly like it. It's not something that grows wild around here, but it is a native plant. And this is um, amaranth. And it's the one that grows out west. This is Hopi red dye amaranth. Obviously, they would use it for, and the, the plant does make a beautiful dye, this wonderful burgundy color. This can be a gorgeous plant in the garden just as a a wildflower, if you will, next to um, the gold of sunflowers, which is a really pretty way to, uh, to plant it because it gets very tall. But the, the leaves are edible. They're a great um, vegetable. And the, um, the seeds out of them, let me show you the seeds, which I don't over here. The seeds are winnowed out. And if you can see how they look like, um, well, poppy seeds, they're about that size of poppy seeds when they're wintered out and you use them the same way, but you've got nutrition in this uh, that you wouldn't have in the, in the poppy seeds. Uh, it's a grain amaranth and these have three times the, um, let's see, uh, three times the fiber of wheat and five times the iron of wheat and twice the calcium of milk. So it's pretty amazing. It can be ground into flour. You can uh, boil it up into a, a cereal. I'm sure that's what indigenous peoples did. They had a lot of uh, seeds that, uh, that would, would cook like that. So it's like a breakfast gruel. Um, and then of course used as, a, you know, like poppy seeds, I put that in um, muffins and pound cake and things like that. But you can also pop them. Um, it makes like tiny miniature popcorn which is kind of a fun thing to, to watch and see and to, and to eat. So that's fun for the, for the kids. There's another one, which is the more commercial form of grain, and that's a golden amaranth. And I believe that the, um, the golden amaranth might have been what the natives were sending the Spaniards off looking for the city of gold, because uh, when you have, a say, a large quantity of the golden grain and you're pouring it from one vessel to another, it looks like molten gold. And so it could have been a misunderstanding between, you know, the sign language between the Indians and the Spaniards. And they thought because this was such an important um, part of their lives of this golden grain, I think they thought that's what the Spaniards were looking for. And actually where they were sending them 
was the area where this golden grain was grown. So that's a possible theory that they really just, it was a misunderstanding, but you'll see amaranth in uh, pasta products in the market. And that comes from the, uh, the golden form of, of this amaranth, but you can have your own uh, grain and a beautiful addition to your wildflower garden as well. Uh, and a vegetable off of the leaves too. So uh, another good one to have. The, um, another one out here is uh, something that is, that I grow for my cats and that is catnip. But the Cherokee have always used catnip tea for colic for babies. And so I always have it around here because my cats love it. And then if we have stomach aches or anything like that, then we have it uh, medicinally. Uh, as well for catnip tea. Strange that it affects humans so differently than, than cats, but it does. Uh, but it's, it's kind of handy to have around. And um, our Cherokee grandmother said that uh, all the grandmothers that she knew always had catnip growing in their gardens uh, in case any of the grandchildren uh, came down with a case of the colic and it would cure it right up. So uh, then something that comes in to your garden, um, you might have probably tried to get rid of it, but it's another good edible. And it's also a good soil indicator, and that is sheep sorrel. And sheep sorrel has the face of a sheep, if you can see the shape of it. And it grows quite liberally in areas where the soil has become too acid. Now this has a sharp taste, um, it's oxalic acid, it's not, uh, um, vitamin C, although it is loaded with vitamins. Um, and this is um, chopped up and added to anything that you need a little bit of a, uh, oh, kind of a bit of zest to your uh, scrambled eggs. I've eaten it in scrambled eggs. I've also um, put it in the blender with uh, uh, orange, um, made an orange juice. And this and some um, dandelion greens in the springtime and the sheep sorrel uh, makes a chartreuse drink. So if you're not used to um, wild edibles and know that something's going to taste good. It might be a little odd first thing in the morning eating a chartreuse colored drink, but it nevertheless, it's very good and loaded with vitamins and minerals. So um, again, remember this is a good soil indicator. If it's grown in your garden and it's supposed to have an alkaline soil, whether you're growing roses or whatever, um, know that you need to add something to change that pH, but also know that this is a good, um, a good edible to have. Uh, and one that Mother Nature planted, one that you didn't plant. And last but not least, um, this year I have joined the Society for Creative Anachronism that my grandson is in. He is uh, quite accomplished swordsman with those medieval reenactors. And I asked if they had an herb lady and they said no. So I'm going to be their herb lady for their events next year. And one of the things that I'm going to be making is, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the remedy of the four thieves. And that was the um, potion that the thieves um, stealing uh, golden jewelry and um, coins from the uh, people dead of the plague, uh, they didn't get sick. And that was pretty strange because people were trying to get, you know, stay clear of the, the dead and get rid of them as soon as possible. And these fellows were coming along and they were stealing and surviving. So when they were caught and brought up to court, um, the judge was asking them, how in the world did you keep safe? This was such a, a, a weird event. How in the world could they do all this and still be safe from the plague? And they said a monk had given them the recipe for this potion and it was parsley and sage sage and rosemary, <coughs> excuse me, and thyme. So they boil this up and then uh, rub themselves completely in it, either bathed in it if they had enough or uh, wiped it all over their bodies. And of course it was a terrific insecticide. So the fleas carrying the plague were not getting on them and so they didn't get sick. And if you know the song about um, going to Scarborough Fair with parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. That's what it's talking about. It was an old song about that if you go to um, gathering of a lot of people, then you need to take 
parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme so that you can protect yourself from any uh, ailments that might be going around in the population. So unfortunately with our pandemic, I don't think that's gonna make a difference. So um, I think we're best with uh, probably sticking to our antivirals with our blackberries and elderberries and those things uh, to keep us safe. So I hope everybody does stay safe. That's, that's my wish for all of us. And, uh, and if you're home alone, bake an el elderberry apple pie and enjoy. <laughs> All right, thanks. I'll take some questions if you have any. Yes, I'm waiting for some questions to come. That's fascinating, Isla. While we're waiting for, for questions, you and I were talking yesterday about the there, you know, when you're going back to talking about the um, about the lambs quarter and growing in the cornfields and how I, I think that's so funny that the eight of the ten noxious vegetables are in your garden. Um, but we were talking about how there's no such thing as a plant without a purpose. And you shared a little anecdote with me about somebody that brought up a particular plant and a very clever young man. Um, who had a theory, so about the poison ivy. Oh, right. Um, I had mentioned that um, every plant has a use if we but discover it, because there, no, nothing is, is, is on this planet that you know, doesn't serve a purpose. And someone asked in my class and said, well, what about poison ivy? And um, I had told them, well, then I found out, I was doing some research and I found from the uh, Wilcox company that bought from Wildcrafters, that he was selling truckloads of poison ivy to a pharmaceutical company. And he asked why, and they said it was for paraplegics. Well, later on in um, CNN, about four years later, I heard that there'd been some experiments using uh, extract of poison ivy that would regrow damaged nerves. And we thought, well, that is, you know, good news for paraplegics. But in the, in the class of the children, one of them had uh, piped up and said, well, now think about it, poison ivy would keep people away from things like ginseng that didn't need to be over harvested or you know, maybe keep it away from bird nests or you know, things like that. So they called it a protector plant. And I would say for most of us, although I'm not allergic to it, so um, I can walk through it and use it, but uh, most people are pretty allergic to poison ivy, so it would definitely keep them out of a place that, that needed to be protected. So, um, so there's that, that reason. Um, that he came up with. And then I haven't heard anything more about the experiments of uh, using it for um, damaged nerves, but um, let's hope it comes through that it really will. That's, that's very interesting. And, and I'm grateful if it, that does come to pass to whoever's harvesting the poison ivy, I wouldn't want to be me, but um, I do have a question. Um, if somebody I knew, obviously, I'm going to recommend your, your book, um, it, Roadside Ramble. Rambles is the name of your cookbook with tips and, and what have you. But if there are other resources for people that are interested in wild crafting and foraging, do you have any that you would particularly recommend? Uh, there are the um, um, Peterson Field Guides are still excellent. Uh, they have them on um, edible plants and medicinal plants. So there's separate books and there's one for the Eastern United States. Um, there's one by John Callis. I can't remember the name of his book. I'm sorry, I don't, but it K-A-L-L-A-S. John Callis is a doctor who got interested in foraging and he has an excellent book out um, with edibles and uh, very good uh, photographs in it. Um, then there's um, Magic and Medicine of Plants, which is still one of my favorites. It's been around for like 25 or 30 years. Excuse the phone, I had a feeling it would ring. <laughs> I have any way to turn it off. I don't think, let me try. Hold on. Um, let me try to get it. When, the, when old world meets new world. Yes, right. Um, the Magic and Medicine of Plants is a large book. It's one that you use to reference when you come back from um, uh, foraging or backpacking or whatever. Um, and um, you, it's written by the um, several authors from the Reader's Digest uh, company, and it has history of herbals. Um, it has recipes. It has a uh, photograph and a drawing of each plant, and it has 
what the folklore was and then what the scientific results show that yes, it was, or yes, it wasn't good for that. So it's fantastic information that I've never found any other book exactly like that one. I've had it for years, it's falling apart and it has a different cover on it now. We may have, Alan may have an un um, Are we back? Yeah, you're back, you're back. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, did, I did look up the John Callis book. It's called um, Edible Wild Plants, Wild Foods from Dirt to Plate. That's yeah. Okay. That's it. Yeah. And that's, then, that's a good one for him. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple questions. Um, um, one is where do you suggest looking for, um, for elderberries? I know they grow along a roadside, but any particular conditions more conducive to finding them than others? Well, strangely enough, one of the ones that's the biggest one that I've ever seen was next to a motel next to the road in town uh, where I've gotten them. But um, generally it's a roadside if they haven't been cut by the uh, DOT coming along. Um, so um, it may have something to do with the pH. I know that over in Graham County, I would see uh, fields of it, a lot of it. And then as I came um, in over into uh, Swain and then now into Jackson County, I see fewer and fewer of them. So. There must be, I've not ever studied to see exactly the pH of how it should be, you know, where it grows the best. Um, but generally it's a roadside. I have seen them on Highway 74. I've seen them on the roadside going toward Waynesville in different places. You'll see them in the spring because you see the big white umbel of flowers. Um, then I look for them, you know, later to see if I can find the berries. You just know what that uh, flower looks like in, um, in, in June. And then you can, um, make a note of where those are, make a, a, a definitely make notes because I'll, I'll forget and then I won't see them later. But like I said, the one that I thought was the largest for some reason was at a motel. Uh, I was glad they'd let it uh, continue to grow. Most places will cut them down, but someone there may appreciate it and maybe like the flowers for some reason and, and has let it um, continue to survive then it's still there. I, I miss the birds got the, the, the berries this year and I miss getting as many as I usually do. But well, I will road say, sign is I was gonna say, you can, you can see, um, you can find them in the village green. I'm not gonna encourage for, foraging them in the village green. And then I have a message from one of my colleagues at the land trust that says elderberries generally grow in wetlands and there are even some in the village green to, to that point, so. Um, true that would be uh, generally well okay I'll say this too I just remembered a fact about um, elderberry if you are looking for a place to dig a well on new property if you find an elderberry bush that's where you dig because they say that water is no more than 12 feet under an elderberry bush so okay. yes it, it does grow somewhere even if you don't see there's any you know water um, on surface there's going to be water underground that sounds like they like wet feet which means that you know probably this year they should be plentiful. Um, but I have another question from someone who lives near a lot of sassafras trees and was wondering if you use their leaves, bark, roots medicinally or for culinary purposes. I have heard of sassafras tea, so um, I'm guessing maybe you might have some other ideas. Right, sassafras tea is from the um, from the roots, and if you have a tree and you look for um, several young sprouts around it is what most people do in Appalachia is, is dig up the, uh, the young sprouts and use those uh, roots for tea. Fortunately, you can boil it three or four times and still get tea off of it. So you get viable tea. It's not something that you would boil up and throw away. So it's useful for you know several pots of tea. Uh, we used to get in the markets, you used to get root bark, which would have been uh, from say a large root from a big tree and they would take, uh, chips off of the uh, root and sell it. I used to see it down in, um, um, in Helen, Georgia. I used to buy it down near Betty's store, I think it was, used to carry it. It's not on the market anymore. Uh, they took it off because the FDA said that it was, um, the saffron in it was carcinogenic. But according to Dr. James Duke of USDA research for over 35 years, uh, he said it's perfectly safe in the quantities that we drink it. 
uh, saffron is the um, the main uh, medicinal uh, property in it. I know a lot of um, Appalachian folks had used that uh, for their blood pressure because it is a, a blood thinner. But nevertheless, he said it's he said uh, there's more saffron in a can of beer than there is in a glass of tea. But one has a lobby in Congress and one doesn't. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, leaves are the um, are dried and powdered for um, the filet for gumbo filet, mm. and there's folks down in um, Louisiana, Mississippi, and places where uh, the sassafras grows prolifically. And since that's in their culture for their uh, cuisine, uh, they're folks that make um, a side sideline business out of collecting and drying and uh, packaging the dried sassafras leaves. It's a it's a good thickener. Plus, it gives a little extra flavor that makes um, gumbo filet what it is. So those are the two, two parts of it that you would use. There is a, and I have had it, the early spring leaves, the tiny little leaves and flowers uh, have sort of a lemony taste. And so you have another flavor uh, for a tea. Um, you'd maybe have one or two cups, you wouldn't have much, but nevertheless, there is a flavor in the spring from that. And then you have the, um, the powdered leaves and then root, um, the boiled roots for your sassafras tea. Nice. So it is. Mm -hmm. That was good to know that it is safe. <laughs> Absolutely. And I also have a question about drying herbs. Do you have a recommended method that you like to employ? For drying? Um, I do air drying in, in a dark place. Uh, something warm. Um, I have a very warm um, screen porch. Uh, some people use, um, if they have a closet for the hot water heater, it's a good warm place. It's dry. Um, but air drying is still, I think, the best. Most of the time, if you use a um, dehydrator, you lose the volatile oils. Uh, some things um, work, but I haven't been very successful in drying herbs uh, to keep the, uh, um, the, the flavor in it too well by using the dehydrator. It seems to be either too fast or too much heat or something. Um, so uh, I generally air dry. Uh, some things you can put in a, uh, plastic, uh, not plastic, in a paper bag, and you can hang them. You can put in a paper bag. If it's something that's going to be possibly falling off or there might be dust to it or something, you can put it in a paper bag and then put it in a warm, dry place and dry it that way. Um, I also have a, a screen, a clean um, screen that was taken off one of my windows when we changed out windows, and I kept one. And that's another thing that to use if you have a, a porch or someplace that, that you can lay it out then you can lay things out where you, you're going to get good or circu air circulation on top and bottom and then store it in a plastic in a uh in a paper bag do it that way do you ever use your herbs to make your own essential oils um not too often um we don't use the oils that much um but we do occasionally uh using um the Olive oil is mainly what I use. Sometimes I'll have uh, sweet almond oil and, mm -hmm. um, and put them in that, mm -hmm. sometimes. Great, well, I'm gonna give one last call for questions. Anybody else have any questions for Isla? Isla, what's your latest project? I know you're always working on something. Oh, um, well, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to finish a, a quilt for a naturalist grandma. Um, have been about five years at it because being that I work during the time that all the, the leaves are out and then when I have the time in the winter time there aren't any leaves. Um, the idea is that um, I'm pressing the leaf, painting the leaves and pressing them on the, the quilt fabric and then I have done embroidery for all of the uh, flowering trees uh, with magnolia and rhododendron and those things. So those are all embroidery and those have been done for a couple of years. And I'm hoping this summer to um, try to get it finished. I'm the only grandmother in the family that hasn't done a quilt. And being a naturalist, I said, well, it's going to have to reflect, you know, who I am and what I do. It's got to be something natural. So I'm trying to do all of the, um, the leaves for the trees and the Smokies. And it's about, I guess it's about halfway done for the, the top. And I'm hoping to get, get around to getting the leaves. But that's been the problem is I'm busy. <laughs> When the leaves are out, then I'm not busy when I don't have the leaves. So I'll try to get finished this summer, but that's my, that's my project for right now. And I'm also 
in the midst of uh, doing a jam. I'm doing my daughter's um, pear tree is loaded. So I've been making pear jam and um, grape jam, wild grape jam and uh, things like that. Whatever, whatever fruit turns up and uh, in my kitchen is going to get used in something. That's, that's awesome. Um, and just, to, I, I love it. I love the, the whole quilt and, and that being such a part of who you are. And of course, you know, what we're, you know, we're celebrating, you know, women in, during the month of August and the accomplishments that, um, that women have made. And you certainly have made a tremendous accomplishment in your life towards um, towards ethnobotany and, and, and being a naturalist. I love that your quilt's going to reflect that part of your, your personality and your identity. Um, and just to confirm with the elderberry syrup, um, especially for a few of our latecomers, that what you do is you, um, you either fresh pick the elderberries and you use a hair pick or you pick them and you freeze them and then they come, they come um, free and then you boil them and strain them so that you get the elderberry, you know, the juice, and then you mix it with honey. And, and, that's, and that's how you get, you, you make your elderberry syrup. And you did point out, you might want to hold up again if you don't mind, somebody ask a question about how they resemble pokeweed and the way that the leaves that you can use to identify so that you're not picking the wrong, you're picking the wrong thing. Um, that's so one can, leaf or the elderberry? Yep. That's the elderberry leaf right there. And also the, um, the devil's club or devil's walking stick uh, has thorns, which this one does not, um, will ever have thorns. And the, uh, the berries being the same color as that particular plant, these, will, because of the weight of them, they're gonna hang down like this. Uh, whereas the, um, the other plant, they're gonna be long, uh, what I call a racine or a long branch of berries. So that tells you that this is definitely the elderberry plus the, the leaves like this. It's also said, and I didn't mention this, but the leaves um, rubbed um, make an insect repellent. They said they use that on the on the skin for an insect repellent. So we'll maybe we'll try it this summer and see. But anyway, so does that help to that, that uh, helps that helps a lot. And 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 I know you also mentioned to those that were asking about the elderberry syrup that um, that our native variety is not going to be as strong as as some of the you know over the counter brands. So just to be mindful of that, but it does still have the the antiviral properties that are so important. And I know that we're all valuing right now, especially not only with the with the coronavirus, but going into cold and flu season. That's that's really important. And if you don't have enough blueberries. If you find some and you think I'm not going to have enough syrup that's going to last. You can mix it with blackberries. Blackberries are antiviral as well. So you could do half and half elderberries and blackberries if that's what you have on hand. And it's still an antiviral syrup. That's, that's good to know. That's good to know. Well, I will just remind people, um, I think that's all the questions. I'll remind people that I have been recording uh, this presentation. And so if you, obviously you have the link to, um, to the program this evening, I'll be sending a follow-up email to everybody that registered with, um, with a link to the video that you can share that will be on demand viewing. If you happen to not remember something that, that Isla said, um, I've made a few notes of some of the resources that she's recommended in addition to, um, I'll be sending information about her, the book that, um, that she's written, wrote the Roadside Rambles book that um, has lots of recipes and tips. I, am, I own a copy and, um, and it's, it's, a great, it's a great resource as well. So I'll be sending that in a follow-up email um, for everyone to have. And um, just to let you know, I've already actually had a lot of interest in next month's um, presentation. It's interesting, we didn't, you know, because this is such an unusual year, we've had to reschedule and reshift and shuffle our programming and pre presenters. And it just seems like we have this theme of, of edibles and edible gardening and forage gardening and pollinator gardening. It, I, it's like we're craving just really good nutritious food right now, which I think I find so interesting. But the topic for next month's um, program is titled Edible Fungi, How Mushrooms Can Change the World. And uh, Joey Kyle from the Mountain Learning um, Center and Retreat Center 
um, will be our presenter. Um, I have not yet created that Zoom link. I've, like I said, I've had a lot of interest already in that program. So, um, so make sure to check back with me in early September. I'll be sending the registration information out about that. And um, it will be, again, another Zoom presentation. Um, but just a final word to say, thank you so much, Isla. It's always a treat. And the last time you were with us, you made one of Jerry's Harvest Pies and it was so delicious for us to sample. I can just almost taste that apple elderberry pie. And now that we all know that it's a good pie for you, we should run out and make it for ourselves. But you truly are a treasure. And, and I know that our, um, the Highlands Cashers Land Trust and the Village Green so much appreciate you every time that you come to present. I learned something new. So, so thank you very much. And thank you everyone for, for participating this evening. Um, make sure you eat well and that you be well. Thanks again, Isla. Thank you. Appreciate it. It was fun. Right. Take care. <laughs>